Hi. My voice is going slightly, so I definitely need the microphone. So uh, this is my desk. Uh, um, as Sheena mentioned, I'm an artist, and my practice brings together technology, literature, drawing, and kind of sits between lots of... Well, I feel it sits between lots of different disciplines, between the artistic, scientific, and the academic. I'm particularly interested in working with abstract collections of information or data, particularly self-generated data sets, which is going to be the focus of my time at the CCI, to create new and unusual narratives in a variety of different mediums, and how new technologies, such as machine learning, can be used to translate them clearly to an audience. And I work, as I mentioned, between technology, literature, drawing, writing, installation, sound, machine learning, artificial intelligence, generative design, and the thing that draws it all together is a use of technology. But as I think Georgia mentioned, um, I work both with technology at the front end of the project. So kind of what is the thing, what the thing is that is installed in the gallery. But equally importantly, or equally important to my practice is working with technology at the back end of my project. So the kind of research that I do in order to make something. And although I work heavily with technology, my intention is never to make work that is about technology for its own sake, but rather I'm really interested how you can use these new and emerging technologies as a tool or a way or a process to talk about other things like memory or love or decay in a way that augments or changes the thing that you're trying to talk about in a way that you couldn't do before. And that's, I think, is why I find machine learning so interesting, because it just feels like such a powerful way to do these things. And there really has been, I think, in the last year or so, you can see this real rise of machine learning. It's becoming more and more prevalent in the international fine art scene. There's, you know, it's exhibitions at Arts Electronica, Serpentine Gallery, v &A, Barbican, um, there was the obvious auction uh, where a GAN-generated artwork was sold for nearly half a million dollars. It seems to be more and more pervasive in this, in this fine art scene. And not only in, in uh, and as Georgia mentioned, not just talking about art in the purely visual art sense, but also across a broad range of disciplines. Holly Herndon used it um, to create her latest album. But I am a primarily a visual artist, so the kind of technology that I'm mostly interested in is um, ones that produce visual outputs. This is a slide which, as Alex mentioned, is probably prehistoric because it's from a couple of years ago, which was from a paper that uh, Facebook released where they trained um, a model on thousands of paintings in order for it to produce images in unconventional styles. The idea of this project um, was to make art that was novel, but not too novel. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and what's also interesting about this particular experiment is that once these images were produced by the model, members of the public were asked to judge them alongside paintings that were produced by people um, in an online survey without knowing which were generated by AI and which were created by people. And participants... Of, answered questions about how complex or novel they felt each image was and whether it inspired them or elevated their mood, which I think is also very bizarre using Mechanical Turks to kind of answer whether an image is inspirational. But what they found was that the images produced by AI scored slightly higher in many cases than those generated by humans. And there were all sorts of headlines after this about how machine learning is going to overtake the art scene and all these kind of hysterical... Um, hype-based headlines. And for me, that misses a really important part of making art. It's not about whether something can create art, um, because the focus of these experiments and this research has been to consider and judge the results of art as whether it looks like art. So considering it through the visual parameters on a viewer which for me ignores a really huge consideration of an artist when producing a piece. That of the impact of the materials and the context and how it is displayed and considered by an audience. And producing an image using a GAN, a generative adversarial network, versus any other way gives the viewer different experiences, expectations, histories, traces, context to consider. And I'm really interested in my practice 
as to what are these associations and how might they be used in a piece of work. You have a different reaction to a photograph than to a drawing than to a painting. And can, again, or the training set, which I'll come to in a bit, become an actor and an agent within the artistic process in the way that other materials can? can they and can these reactions be used to push a piece? The conversation that is rooted, rooted in the danger of machines and whether machines are better than humans and are computers going to put art artists out of work is not that interesting for me. And I'm going to kind of slightly ignore it in this talk and instead focus on what I feel is interesting about these materials. And I'll talk a little bit about the different materials and their different, kind of, for me, their contexts, and then talk about how I've used it in a recent work that I made, Mosaic Virus. Um, so, again, I can skip through this quite quickly, I hope, um, because there's been, Alex covered it in far more um, detail than I could. But... And this is quite an old version of it. This is a one that a paper that came out in 2016 called a Singan. And that again is the kind of like the core algorithm that I use in my work. They are notoriously unstable and not that well understood by researchers. They're this complex iterative process with many interdependencies where one network mimic, um, attempts to mimic imagery um, to the extent that the kind of like that the fake imagery is indistinguishable from the training set on which it was trained on over the course of many cycles of learning. So this video that is playing is not just images that are part of photographs that have been stitched together, but pictures that have been entirely generated or imagined of what the AI thinks the image should be in each category in question. And even though this was came out of a science paper, um, the images are incredibly beautiful. They have this kind of really meandering dreamlike quality to the results. The results that are recognizable as being what the thing in question is, but at the same time have these tells that show that they are not real. And as was spoken about earlier, these tells, there is a finite amount of time when they, are, they will exist. The technology is becoming better and better. Industry wants realism. And this week alone, 282 papers were uploaded with new research on this area. Um, this, I don't know if you saw this um, from a story that was this June, which was this image, which was on a LinkedIn profile um, uh, of a woman called Katie Jones, uh, who on LinkedIn was connected to a deputy assistant secretary of state senior aide to senator, a famous economist who was being considered for a seat on the Federal Reserve. But this image was a fake image. It was a phantom profile that was um, set up probably as part of a state-run operation. And you can kind of see, if you look carefully at the image, if you really consider it, you can kind of see all of these small tells that show you that it has not, it's not been, it's not a photorealistic it's not a photo, it's this kind of like GAN generated image, but you have to look so carefully to see this. And so I think kind of like in the future, there is going to be this real need for this type of looking, for this type of observation of photographs and, or for this type of observation of imagery. But I am not that interested in this type of result. You know, I'm not a spy, I'm not trying to fake... It. In, like trying to get people to think that this is, I'm, uh, I'm a person that I'm not. Using AI or using machine learning, as we've talked about slightly before, is it, it's incredibly energy intensive. So if you're making something that could just look like a photograph, I would argue that you should just use a photograph. In a weird way, I think this kind of like move towards photorealism makes it less interesting to work with as an art um, as an art form or as, a, as part of an art practice because the better it gets, the kind of like, why, why should you be using it unless you're doing something really with it? The imperfections, the traces of processes is the quality that I love and the quality that I want to use and question and work with. But as I said, it's a finite amount of time that these traces exist. Um, and I like these mistakes in showing how this, these imperfections work as it draws attention to the process and perhaps also what is wrong with the process. 
As soon as something becomes too smooth, it stops being noticeable. And as soon as it stops being noticeable, people stop questioning it or challenging it. And it's important to challenge it because these things are not perfect. As Georgia so wonderfully explained, they're a mirror and reflection of the world that we live in. And so when you're talking about machine learning, I think it's helpful to split out the two materials that you really have when you're working with it. One is the algorithm that Alex really talked very beautifully about. And then the other is the data or the training set. The training sets or the images or inputs that are given to the algorithm provide the knowledge and the, are central to the eventual output and are being increasingly more discussed within this art context. So the Photographer's Gallery is doing a year-long program about the data set. Um, there's a show in the curve about Trevor Paglin's response to the data set. Data sets that are needed, the data sets that are needed to kind of to be used by machine learning are usually extremely large. Thousands and thousands, sometimes millions of images or inputs, and also very often proprietary. Um, so it, while you can go online and Google um, machine learning code and get results really quickly and kind of grab the latest research off Archive or GitHub, you will not be able to find necessarily the associated data that is then needed to train it by these big companies. Um, most of the training sets that are readily available are academic and have been compiled by researchers, often using mechanical Turks, and there's all sorts of interesting things that you can talk about around the invisible labor and associated power structures that, are, that sits behind it. And they use lots of different methodologies, but people are always involved either at in kind of like sourcing the content or in the process, so labeling it. And because of this, they will always come to enshrine cultural or social attitudes, otherwise known as data set bias. And for me, like data is just such a human thing. It's There's no escaping it. Every time you kind of talk about a piece of data, it's really a trace or reflection of someone's life. And for me, that makes it just such a human way and a human thing to work with. So although you talk about artificial intelligence, for me, it's a very human thing to think about and to work with. But going back to ImageNet, which is like one of the most canonical databases. Um, it's got 14 million, million images that are used. And, if, and because it's so large, because it's 14 million images, it's really difficult to kind of like start to go through every single one. But if you do, you start to see these problematic um, labeling and problematic uh, images that are associated with it. So if you look at the way that it's defined, female person and then you look at the kind of like subcategories that you get you start to see this and then if you start to look at the imagery it's highly sexualized similarly with um, monster there are kind of like obviously monster figures but then there are like punks and disabled children um, and this is problematic for me as an artist you like you care about the materials that you use and you have to be conscious of the fact that if you choose to use these off-the-shelf databases, that that bias sits in there. Um, and uh, Georgia talked about uh, the uh, ImageNet roulette that Trevor Paglin did, and this is some of the results. So you can kind of, he did this project where he then took ImageNet and you could upload your photo, and then it would show that label that ImageNet would return, and you can kind of see all of the, the biases that exist in it. But the thing that I really love about that project is that after it went live, ImageNet took responsibility for this bias that sat in its data set, and it um, is scrubbing 1.2 million images because they didn't realize that this bias sat in it. They had never actually gone through it because it was put together by Mechanical Turks. No one person was kind of sitting and looking at each one, and it took an artistic project to bring this out and for them to change it. So for me, this is a very, very long-winded way of me saying that self-generated data is incredibly important. Either making it myself, so making each of the images that go into my data set, or by constructing them from an existing data source, so taking something and really looking at each thing that is going in, it becomes, in a way, a decisive creative act. And it is the thing that is within your control if you have no coding experience whatsoever. And there is an art to it. There is really an art to kind of creating these data sets. I found 
this on Wikipedia, which is up until relatively recently, under British copyright law, like a database was considered to be a literary work because of the recognition of the skill that goes into it. And I think in the next kind of like the next thing that will happen around machine learning and creativity will be this issue of data set creation. Um, I think there are all sorts of things coming out now, like um, issues around the obvious sale and who owned what and issues around copyright. And in a way, though, this conversation was started in the 80s around sampling and music and was never really resolved. And I think this is going to be something that will come out when we start thinking about the future of artistic practice using machine learning. So how have I used this in my own work? Um, playing um, is a kind of snippet of a piece that I made called Mosaic Virus, which draws historical parallels between tulip, the tulip mania that swept across the Netherlands and Europe in the 1630s to the speculation that is, well, is or was, it was when I made it, ongoing around cryptocurrencies. Each still is generated using machine learning, using a GAN to create a tulip blooming, an updated version of a Dutch still life of the 21st century, where the appearance and kind of um, shape of the tulip is controlled by the bit price of Bitcoin. I wanted to draw together these ideas around capitalism, value, and the tangible and intangible nature of speculation and collapse from these two different but um, actually similar moments in history. Um, and, uh, and what is tulip mania? So tulip mania was a, a 17th century phenomenon that saw tulip prices skyrocket and then collapse and is often held up as an example of early speculative, of the first known speculative bubble, which is why there's these comparisons to um, the boom in cryptocurrency. You can kind of see that they, they follow the same path on a graph. And I'm not the first person to make this comparison between Bitcoin and tulip mania. The former president of the Dutch Central Bank described it as being, as Bitcoin being worse than tulip mania back in 2013. And there are obviously differences between these two very complex economic systems, but both are depicted by historians and bankers as being this unstable frenzy doomed from the very start. And also I quite like this because there's even a blockchain conference called Tulip, which shows a surprising amount of self-awareness um, from the blockchain community. Um, but in my research, I wanted to kind of go beyond just how these prices and of these two things behave on a graph and make maybe some further links more and make these more fully by my choice of using machine learning. Oh, this is horribly pixelated, but you can kind of get the picture. So the demand for tulip bulbs in this period, in the 1630s, um, was driven partially by bulbs affected by a virus known as the mosaic virus where if the bulb had this virus, the flowers that they would produce would have these very distinctive stripes. But without a clear understanding of how the virus affected tulip bulbs, because they couldn't predict whether the, um, the bulb would have it, and it became this kind of thing, the virus helped drive the speculative buying and selling of the bulbs, which apparently the, the most expensive bulb at the time sold for the same price as an Amsterdam townhouse. Um, and they only discovered that the virus was caused by a strain of a disease. Um, it was discovered in the 1920s. Um, before that, they had no idea what caused these stripes, and they used to do all sorts of crazy things, like take a red tulip, slice it in half, take a white tulip, slice it in half, glue it together, put it in the ground, hope that it would create stripy tulips, and do things like take the earth that had produced stripy tulips and like send it to England and see if that would work and all sorts of things. And the virus is interesting because it's one of the only known instances of a plant disease actually hugely increasing the value of the infected plant. And I think there's something that is quite nice about how something is that is essentially an error is driving this like weird economic boom. And these the 
These stripes gave the tulip a special aura, surrounding it with mystique and the language of alchemy. And growers deliberately wanted this. They deliberately wanted these stripy tulips to seem strange, difficult and unobtainable because that increased its value. And this lack of understanding around the thing generated me, generating wealth reminded me so much of the rush towards blockchain when it started. This is just one small example where Long Island Ice Tea Corporation, which produces soft drinks, changed its name to Long Blockchain Corporation and when it did this, company shares soared as much as 500% in pre-market trading. They didn't start specializing in blockchain. They just added the name blockchain to their, to their company name. And it's just this weird kind of thing where people just don't really care about how the thing works. They just know that it's special and exciting and, and valuable. And so for me, those kind of like ideas, you could start to kind of bring them, bring them together in a nice way. And it's also worth noting that these are some quite old, um, some of them are quite old um, headlines, but machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence, everything is in its own hype bubble at the moment. You can't open newspapers, you can't listen to the radio, watch the TV without some kind of ridiculous story coming out about how robots or machine learning is going to take over the world. And so... This is something, this hype. So it's not just about the hype around tulips, it's not just around the hype around cryptocurrencies, but also as a material, it, is a, it in itself is in its own hype bubble. And I wanted to bring that all together. And I wanted to use, again, not merely as a tool, but as another way of understanding the subject matter. Um, if you start working with them, or if you work with them, kind of like, you will see that uh, when you're training them, so when you kind of give them information, kind of like start to watch the output, they have this real tendency to seem like they're improving and then suffer something called mode collapse, where they just kind of like stop making things and just produce the same thing over and over again, just like markets do. So if you kind of like think about how the learning rate, so if you, if you work with this stuff, like you can see the learning rate going up and up and up and up and then crashing, just like those graphs that I showed at the beginning showing how... Um, financial markets behave. And so for me, as these models try and strive towards capturing the beauty of the tulip, its collapse mirrors the ups and downs of speculative bubbles. So as a material, it's echoing its subject matter. The other nice kind of like parallel that you can start to draw in this, or I could start to draw in this project, was that there is this tradition of um, using tulips in art history. Tulips featured prominently in Dutch still lives at the time, the so-called Vanitas paintings, that showed how beauty and treasure are only fleeting, which is quite nice for a piece that is essentially about the stock market. But when, if you look at this painting, it shows flowers that kind of like exist in spring and summer and autumn and maybe winter, but it's not produced, it's not painted from life, it's painted from the fragments that um, the painter had kind of like gathered through his existence. And for me, that seems like a really nice parallel to how these GANs work. It's not just taking something from the training set and reproducing it, it's kind of using its knowledge of what it's seen. So it's using its knowledge of the data set to then produce something real. So for me, it's something new. So for me, this is like, a really nice way to update this tradition and use kind of like the history of how these things were created in the piece. Because I wanted to echo that aesthetic of the Dutch, Dutch still life and because of all of the reasons that I talked about, um, like about the problems of using someone else's data set and also because you just can't Google um, imagery of tulips with stripes and expect to get anything meaningful back. A large part of my work on this project was creating my own data set. Um, I was in the Netherlands, so it was actually affordable, but I still ended up spending about a thousand euros on tulips. I took 10,000 photographs of tulips. And the reason why I stopped making my data set wasn't because 10,000 is a nice round number, although it is, it's because tulip season ended so even though this is an incredibly digital piece, it was driven by the rhythms of nature. Um, and also this shouldn't have surprised me given the context, but it was actually really, really difficult to find stripy tulips. I was going all around kind of like um, being like, give me stripy tulips. Um, 
And by creating my own data set, it forces me to examine each image that I'm taking and inverts the usual process for kind of like working in this way. There is like, there is such a big difference between scraping 2,000, 20,000 images from a Google search of a certain item and taking those 20,000 images yourself. When you do the latter, you notice things and you don't, and you really start paying attention to the world and seeing things all over the place. So when I was doing this, when I was in this mindset, I was just seeing tulips everywhere and I was seeing stripes everywhere. And it really alters the way that you kind of exist and look in the world. And the process becomes like craft. And I think this, this kind of like notion of art and craft is quite nice to think about in relation to the data set and the algorithm. Because craft is kind of repetitive, it's time consuming, it's often anonymous versus the kind of um, notion of uh, of art which is authored and um, is kind of like given higher precedence on the totem pole of art and craft um, and I think there's, there are some similarities between data sets and algorithms there and it is kind of like it, it I spent months doing this it was incredibly time consuming but so necessary to my eventual kind of like work that I produced and there really is a skill to creating a data set just like there is a skill to having a craft. If you make the data set too big, if there are too many images, it's, well, number one, it's just very expensive and time consuming. But also for me, if it's too, if the, if the vocabulary is too good, the quirks and the kind of oddities that for me make it a really interesting medium to work with start to disappear. But if you make a data set that is too small, then the model won't have enough information and will either kind of like produce either nothing, it will just produce noise, or it will produce one or two variations from the training set again and again. And because I sort of knew what the output wanted, I wanted the output to be, when I was making or testing, making and testing, I would kind of like go through this process of like buying certain flowers or not buying certain flowers because, and kind of really mixing the imagery and the, the objects that I was um, doing to create my data set. And then, so, and once I had made my data set, because it took such a long time, and because I realized that there was such a skill to it, I decided to make this a separate artwork in and of itself. So Mosaic Virus was the moving image piece, and this is a piece that I call Myriad, and that I display it separately, and I treat it separately, and I treat it as an artwork. And part of this process, part of the labor of making the data set was also the act of categorization because a uh, model doesn't really know, as kind of like Alex explained, it doesn't really know, it doesn't really understand what, what it is. It's just kind of looking at patterns and you have to kind of give it information in order for it to do something that we will consider meaningful. And so I had to tell the model that I was making various different things about the photographs it was receiving, what color they were, what type of tulip, how striped it was, whether it was a bird or dying. And this was, such a large amount of work and it's work that is usually hidden and by choosing to make it a separate work and to really choose to display it in relation to the video work I wanted to draw attention to this act of categorization and also the really human element of it by handwriting each of the labels part of one of my interests is bringing the human out of the technology technological because I think sometimes when you kind of like look at digital art, it seems to neuter a lot of the messiness of the world. And I'm interested in how you can do the opposite, how you can use these models to maintain and accentuate the sense of human that is behind it. And you can start to have discussions once you do this about the fact that there always is a human decision somewhere along the chain of using AI and how this is not always an absolute correct thing. So even as something as simple as a tulip, it becomes incredibly difficult to put this into discrete categories when you start to do it. Like, is it white or is it pink? Is it orange or is it yellow? And if it is something, if it is difficult for something that is as simple as a tulip, it then, when you start to think about how will you do this for something as complex or gender as identity, it becomes, you, you, once you start to do this act, you realize like the complexity and the difficulty of doing this, this, this is. And I also wanted to make this kind of like information physical. So the entire installation, which has only been shown once, is 100 square meters. 
Um, and you have a really different reaction if you walk into a room that is kind of like this size and see all of these photographs plastered on the wall and the kind of amount of labor, the time, the effort, the mistakes, because like often I will kind of like cross things out when I disagree with myself when I go back to look at it. Um, than if you just kind of like have these images on a thumb drive and scroll through them. And it's really easy to forget in a digital age that the things that kind of like, that essentially inform all of the things that we're talking about, inform the algorithms, inform these models, are real things that started in the real world. And part of the ways that I wanted to kind of think about this installation was to um, bring it back so that people can start to understand aspects about it that in a way that they might have before. And one of the things that I quite, well, one of the things that I found interesting about this particular project is it started out purely as a process thing. It started out purely as something that I was just doing because I wanted to make the artwork. And then it became an artwork in and of, in and of its own right. And now it's been nominated for a design award. And so it, it is kind of like, for me, it's interesting because we are at this moment where people just kind of like, are questioning all of these things. So it's possible to make work that kind of, you might think starts in one place and ends up somewhere completely different. And I think a question for me, as I've made it, because it's gone through lots and lots of different iterations in the kind of year and a half that I've been working with it. It raises questions about working with it as a material, namely, when should you stop? Because the, ver the 2018 version that I did of it looks very different now and then like um, advances in technology came about so that you can get these much more realistic looking tulips and you know like is it a search for perfection are you trying to make things that look really realistic um, and for me that's something that like I'm not I'm not quite sure I don't have the answer and and the thing that I kind of want to end um, on this project is that Despite all of this categorization, despite the insane amount of work, it was about four months that I spent building and making and creating my data set. It's impossible to think for me as an artist that I have control. Um, I, can, it, I can never predict what will come out on each of the stills. I can guess, but I can never know. And for me, that is what it makes it really exciting. It's these kind of like mistakes and eeriness that drive me to use it. And most people kind of, or a lot of people put machining, machine learning art within the lineage of generative art because it is algorithmic. But for me, I don't really think of it in that way. Um, for me, I think it's much more helpful to think of it within the context of land and environmental art because what I'm doing in my practice is setting up all of the variables, creating my data set, creating my algorithms and then allowing something else something other to work on it in a way that I can that I cannot predict and that for me is what drives me to make art with it <laughs>